This is Linux Unplugged, episode 17 for December 3rd, 2013. And hello, Planet Earth. Your weekly Linux talk show welcomes you to the closing act of 2013. Pour yourself a cold one and join us around the penguin-shaped table. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, Matt. Here we are, episode 17. It's the final hours of 2013, and it's been a big year, Matt. Oh, it's been huge. I guess this was supposed to be the year of steam, but now that we're coming to an end, the only thing I can think about is Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough, yeah, I can yeah. understand. Yeah, well, yeah, recently... Uh, Bitcoin has been has been sitting above $1,000 right now on uh, Bitstamp, which is where you could actually cash out today if you wanted to. The price is $1,045. Other exchanges have it higher. Those exchanges are full of crap. And I think it's interesting because I have to hold myself back. I don't want to talk about it in the Linux Unplugged show, Matt. That's all I'm thinking about. Oh, yeah? All right. So, you know, this week, Matt, I had a grab bag. Called it Dev Random because um, mm-hmm. I'm funny like that. And I had, a, I, had several, I had several topics I wanted to dig into, sort of suss out. And I, I wanted to start with some of our follow-up this week. But before we get into that follow-up, I wanted to uh, ask you, have you opened the boxes yet, Matt? I have. I did my – usually when I get a review <laughs> item, and this is something I've done for probably over 10 years, is I get a review item, I pop it out of the box, I plug it in, make sure everything's Ooh. working, looks good, drool for a while, cry so, myself – then I cry myself to sleep when I put it back in the box. Yesterday, but. Matt <laughs> got three boxes from System76 on mm-hmm. his doorstep. You got the Leopard Extreme in there, and you got two laptops. You got the new oh, yeah. Kudu laptop and their Ultra Pro laptop. Can't wait to try those things oh, out. They're just gorgeous, gorgeous <sighs> machines. Is, oh. a, is a leopard? How is a leopard extreme heavy? What's it look like, Matt? Is it nice? It, it, I don't. I, I remember carrying it in the last time, and yeah, it weighs. <laughs> it has some weight to it. <laughs> that is solid hardware. You're going to be showing up on Sunday with a car full of gear. It's going to be I awesome. Know, right? Can't wait to try that out. And we even got a little bit of extra time to try these things. I'm going to. I'm going to be banging on a leopard extreme for like a week solid. So we'll have like an extended report on how that thing performs yeah. on the, the big show. Well, um, speaking of the big show. So this week, I want to talk about uh, Sailfish OS and, and the Yala phone as sort of a follow-up. I don't know how many of you out there, if any of you out there listen to Unplugged and don't listen to Linux Action Show, you're a crazy son of a bitch if you do that. What's the <laughs> matter with you? Uh, but uh, one of the things that happened, the biggest thing that happened, we talked about Mint 16, Mate and Cinnamon Edition of uh, the latest release from the Mint Linux Mint project. You would think that would be the thing that, that dominates the dialogue from the Linux Action Show audience. Yeah. No, no, uh, pretty much <laughs> everybody was talking about our coverage of Yala OS, or uh, y- the Yala phone and Sailfish OS. And so Kyle wrote in to the Linux Action Show, and I, 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 uh, I broke into the Linux Action Show's house. I uh, ripped open their little, uh, little sack they have hanging on their uh, refrigerator that holds the Linux Action Show feedback, and I stole it for this show. And so we're going to read uh, Kyle's email, even though it was directed to the Linux Action Show. We're going to break all the rules and... Uh, tie the knots together and cover it here. He writes, Hi, Chris, I'm sure you got more than a few of these emails this week, but hear me out. I was interested to hear what you and Matt might have had to say about Yala's launch of their new phone and OS on this week's show, and I was disappointed to see you dismiss it out of hand. You spent numerous segments and even a whole Linux Unplugged and Coda Radio talking about Canonical's dismal mobile efforts, and when similar gr- small groups of devs not only creates a 1.0 version of their Linux-based OS actually ships it on non-vaporware phone, you blow it off like it's no big deal and don't even bother to research some basic facts about it. Sailfish OS does run Android apps. In fact, he linked us some, to some demos online that show that. And it will run on ha- Android hardware in the future. This is actually one of their main strategies for expansion into China. The device has only been out for a few days and already community members have got Google Play Store support up and running on it. This is exciting and just the sort of thing to expect from an enthusiastic Linux community. In fact, smacks the table. Jala's <laughs> efforts to provide open source compatibility for Android hardware helped out Ubuntu Mobile's efforts and represent a real contribution to the open source community. Furthermore, the Make Play Live project you got so excited about is using Mer, which is Sailfish OS, is which Sailfish OS is also based on, and which Jala is dedicated to supporting in a similar way to how the Linux kernel gets contributions. 
There was a developer-oriented talk by one of the Jala de- Yala de- devs on a subreddit a while back that outlined how Selfish OS is just one aspect of their broader plans for Mer, which sounds very exciting in terms of spreading Linux adoption through devices like the Improv. Sorry if I came across as a bit of a fanboy that Matt's always telling to settle down. I know I've probably been in damage control mode since Amazon... Dro- I know you've probably been in damage control since Amazon dropped their bomb on you, and you haven't had much time to research the topic, but I think you might want to give Yala's a second look. At the very least, I hope you review Sailfish OS once it hits the Nexus 5. On another note, I can't afford to buy a new t-shirt with the cost of the international shipping, but I will start a subscription on Filter next week. I hope you get over the financial problems on Amazon that they've dumped on you, and continue making great contact for the com- content for the community. Thanks. Best. Kyle. So, interesting points, Matt. What are your thoughts? Well, so here's the deal. You know, we never said and, – and it's interesting how if you're not really enthusiastic in a positive way, you're automatically negative. There can right, never be a gray right, area. Right, and right. I noticed that because that's not what happened. Right. What actually did happen is that, for, as he pointed out, it's very early on. So at this moment in time, until I have something in front of me that I can really hold on to, like say, oh, I don't know, Firefox OS, um, you know, that I can actually have an opinion on. We're at a meh moment right now because mm-hmm. there's nothing to really uh, to judge. Um, it would, sounds cool, but Firefox OS actually addresses a specific need. It brings low-end smartphones, lo, you know, accessible smartphones to people that might not otherwise uh, be in the Android if market. I, if I understand so. the other side of this argument, what their point mm-hmm. is is well, – hey, the, the, here's what they would say to that. They would say, hey, dude, look. Uh, Sailfish OS is coming from the folks that made me go, Nokia, yeah. we've got industry ties, we've got a proven track record, we've got Absolutely. a community that's already built. Sure. Uh, we, we are here, we are the proven we are the proven recipe, and we've just shipped. And meanwhile, you're talking about Firefox OS and Ubuntu Touch. And, uh, to I'm my, talking about something I can install on a phone and see right now. Now, if that's, again, I've not researched this heavily, so if I can do that today... Yeah, I'm excited. I, the, if I can't, I will be excited tomorrow. You know, when Kyle today. when Kyle you know says I mean? when Kyle says, "Yo, dog, you're gonna be able to install it on Nexus 5, I think to myself, actually, that's when it crosses the line from yeah. interesting concept cool. to practical product. Bingo. And, I, and it might be a limitation <laughs> in 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 just the fact that there's a lot of things to focus on these days. Sure. And so, unless you can actually play with it, it just maybe doesn't spot, spark that 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 you know interest internally. But I, I go back to that. I, I think my senses from the Linux Action Show audience and the Linux Unplugged audience mm-hmm. is there's just straight up mobile exhaustion. Like Android didn't just kind of pull ahead. Android dominated everybody like in a major way. And, and not s- necessarily in a positive way. It just it just kind of happened. It's kind of like when you spill something all over your keyboard. It's right. there. It makes, <laughs> you know what I mean? It it's makes like- the deployment <laughs> and the adoption rate of Windows look quaint. Oh yeah, it and really so does. I think in 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 that shadow, it's hard to conjure up any genuine excitement because it just seems like it. It, it honestly seems like cavemen going up against a you know the United States government. Oh, I wouldn't go that far. I think that once we again going back to as you pointed out, once we have something tangible in our hands, I can experience the performance of those Android apps running on this. I can experience the flow of the phone. Yeah. Then I can make an educated judgment I, based on that experience. But, but we're not there yet. He's asking me to be excited about okay, nothing. But okay, you know? let's like, say what, what let's say uh, six months down the road, I can buy a Nexus Five and guaranteed, I hook it up to the USB port of my computer. I flip a few buttons and I can I can install Sailfish OS on it. Sure. I'm still probably not going to do it. I mean, I might do it in the sense of try it out, give it my, you know, give it a go, try it for a couple of weeks. But the reality is, is I want applications that are on Android. I want, we if, do. if I'm yeah. going to have a mobile device, I want badass mapping. I want Waze, right? right? I, I want to have all of these things that I are just now come to be expected on a mobile device. I want Netflix on a mobile device for that, for that 15 minutes where, uh, you know, I, we have to wait for something and I, oh my God, I got to do something to occupy mm-hmm. my two kids who are running around like crazy. Let's put totally. SpongeBob on the phone for 15 minutes and it, it gives me a better peace of mind. I but want what, that on what, my mobile device. Right. Can they offer that? I don't think so. And if they but can, we, but how we, well do, do we can? know? But do we know yet? I mean, that's just it. I mean, and I'm not defending the email, but I'm just saying, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, perhaps, possibly, maybe it addresses something in a fashion we haven't experienced yet. If it does, that's yeah. cool. But but yeah, I mean, for myself, I just, I because I think those are valid points, but I think at the end of the day, it, until it's in my hands, for, in my universe, in my world, it's theory. Right. That well, doesn't mean it's theory for the developer. Here's what they have to do. The end user. It is. Here's what they have to do. They have to make yeah. it good enough. And I think they're actually. I think this is why people are really excited about Yala and right. Sailfish OS. Is I think 
they are on the verge, like out of the gate, like out of all the projects out of the gate. Because we Ubuntu Touch has a bunch of phony icons that don't do anything, right, and they're right. relying on yeah. their community who who doesn't I, really care, <laughs> right? To make yeah. make core functions of their operating system, right? So. Yala comes along and they have Sailfish OS and it's a 1.0. It's a straight up respectable 1.0. And they're like, right. and I think these people are like, hey, you assholes, this is almost getting good enough. And I, I'm not saying you have to replace Android one to one for somebody like me to switch because I will jump when it's when it's all I got to do is I, I just got to change a few habits. You know, I got to I mean, I, I got to twist my arm a little bit, but man, I'll switch to get off of Android. I Android's doable, but I you sure. guys I've documented the copious amount of problems I had with Android. Well, and see, that's just it. And I'm, I'm holding out hope, and I would love to see this. I would love to see it to where it provides me the same seamless experience, potentially even a better experience than what Android does. And that includes not only it runs Android apps, but if it runs them at native speeds, performance, yeah, yeah, feel, yeah. I don't want to feel like I'm running wine or something. I want it to feel good. If it does that, it very well may. I don't know. If it does, that's awesome. But until I see it, I have no opinion because well, I, I can't judge it, you know. So yeah. we we I want to I want to make sure I I stress that I do believe we need something like this. So I got the Nexus Five. Sure, um, it's an amazing piece of hardware. It really is great, but it there's a creepy factor to mm-hmm. every time I get a new Android device, more and more is a propri- like uh, is proprietary. It's closed up. Like now, the photo management application that shipped with the Nexus Five. Is, right. is is Google Plus photos. Your right. your your photo gallery is now integrated in with Google Plus and they've deprecated the original gallery app, right? And it's just abandonware. Yeah. It's just totally it abandoned. Yeah. It totally sucks. And so I as as somebody who is cognizant of these types of deficiencies, this bothers me and it makes me want to switch. I don't think it'd ever make Joe user want to switch. And this is where this is where the fundamental lack of enthusiasm comes from for me mm. is how can I get excited about something that 70% of our audience will likely never use. Uh, the, the same could be said for desktop Linux five years ago, though. And so I would say that, you know, that, that was the argument of, well, it's just a hobby operating system, when obviously it's not. It's, it's a very core experience for a number of people, myself included, yourself included. Right. So I, I'm going to be, I'm going to go out on the opt- optimistic level of if it can, in fact, provide me with what I'm looking for, I will be its biggest advocate. If it doesn't, I won't care. So, so it's, I mean, you're in a wait yeah. and see approach. I'm a wait and see guy. Yeah, yeah. I'm very, and I look at that's like I don't get too bent into licensing. I prefer open source licensing, but I don't. It's not a lifestyle for me. I'm not a developer. I just I have a preference, but I'm not married to it. Right. You know, whatever. you have more security in products that use an open source license. Right. Absolutely. I would prefer that. Absolutely. Hands down. We'll even take a hit on you know uh, user experience to a degree yeah. within reason. Yeah. Certainly. Or the amount of hoops you might have to jump through oh, yeah. to make it work. Yeah. I. Yeah. That's where I fall out too. And. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. You know, all companies go through their rock star moment and then they fade. And 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 maybe as that happens to Google, Android, more and more people sure. look for alternatives. And and by that point, these operating systems and these devices will be at a stage where they've had enough to R and D and development and progress forward that they're ready to pick sure. up that slack. And that would be amazing. So, you know, as as Sailfish OS comes out for other for other devices that I can get my hands on, I'm totally going to check it out. I'm keeping my mind open. But I'll be honest, um, I couldn't I couldn't push myself to research the Yala announcement enough to like know it in and out. Like I researched it enough to know what the important moments were and 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 highlight some of those important stories in the show notes. So if folks wanted to go look in the show notes of last week's last, they could go get that info. However, Sorry. you know, myself, I was like, I, I more like wanted to cover it in the show. Mm-hmm. Just to document the important moment for the for the project itself, and not much right. more than that, and and, I, and that really seemed to bother people. Well, and they, it's it's comical because again, it's we're victims of a you know we as the Linux community tend to we're, we're almost religious about things, and sometimes that's uh, almost. Not a, I'm, well, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be brutally honest. It's it's stupid. It's really annoying, and quite frankly, it's it's a real turn off to people that aren't Linux people. Yeah, we got an email about I, I, I've that. I've calloused week. enough to where I it's fine, whatever. Yep, yep. But but regular people are looking at this, thinking, "Wow, you people are nuts." So I mean, you know, for me, I need something tangible. I'm about a user experiences, and that includes the benefits of the open source licensing because there are ben- there are tangible benefits to that. So I mean, I put it in the same bucket. Yep. But a great analogy yep. is looking at the difference between the Steam Box. We're all really excited about that. You ask uh, my seventeen year old nephew what he's excited right. about. Who was really excited about Steam Box? last week until he saw a trailer 
for Killzone for the PlayStation 4. Right. He couldn't give a rat's butt about right. Steambox anymore because something visually tangible is in front of him that yeah. he'd be like, ooh, drool. Yep. And that's what Android's got over these uh, other operating systems. So yeah. I think we're going to have to overcome that. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah you know. good point. All right. Well, uh, so Kyle, when he wrote in, mentioned the, uh, the shirt drive and the problems we've been having with Amazon. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I got a little update. We had a lot of people say, hey, guys, love the shirt. Don't want a long sleeve T-shirt. I want a hoodie. So we added a hoodie. So if you go to teespring.com slash Jupiter 2014, you can grab a hoodie. This is helping us uh, get to our 2014 goal, or at least helping us get through 2013. This is a logo we'll be rolling out in 2014. So now we got a hoodie available. We've got uh, a woman's tee also, if, uh, if you want to get one for your lady, or maybe if and you're so a lady. so that's all in the same, uh, same, uh, same address as before, just yep. in the pull-down? Yep, okay, it's just cool. in the pull-down, and now it all goes towards the goal. Oh. 319 out of 499. That's a great... We're getting there. We're, oh, it just went up to 319. Did you see you know, a change? You know what? You know what? I'll tell you something, Matt. I'll tell you something. The bulk of that is the Linux Action Show audience. Now, there's a good mix yeah. of Coda Radio in there, too. Sure, but the, sure. the bulk of it is is the Linux Unplugged and Linux Action Show audience that have right here alone have almost got us to 320 shirts. I'd love to see that flip over to 320, 325 during the show. The goal here is is we have we have commissioned a new logo for the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. We were planning to roll this out in about March of 2014. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it was one of those things like we were really proud of ourselves because like we were working like way ahead of the game. Like we right. had secrets we were going to roll out in months and I was like, yeah, yeah this is awesome. We we're just All like right. we're ruling. Oh, and then my. um we had a falling out with Amazon and the way that a lot of people contribute and support our network was removed now what we're trying to do is close that financial gap. I sold some Bitcoin so that way we can stay we can keep the lights on, but we are definitely still hurting. And this shirt we've launched over at teespring.com slash Jupiter14. This is an effort for us to continue to fund the network through the remainder of 2013 and also to get you oops, hi there. To get you guys Uh-oh. a little bit of swag so that way you know, you got yourself something. Maybe you want to give it up for the holidays or something like that. And that new logo is so gorgeous. You just display it, right? Just display oh, totally. it. Totally. So uh Go, but based on your popular demand, we now have a hoodie. How awesome is that? That is fantastic. No, it's it's definitely been very popular, and I think it makes sense. I think people see the value in not only uh, participating in the program itself by helping to support it through buying this, but I think they also value the fact that hey, I get to represent. Yeah, people dude. Really that. It yeah. looks, and I, you know what, that new logo looks good on black. Like, oh, that. It looks excellent. It pops like crazy. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 so thank you everybody who, uh, has already picked up a shirt. And, uh, if you haven't gotten one yet, go to teespring.com slash Jupiter 2014. We're trying to get to 500 shirts. Uh, we're not there yet. And if we don't get to 500 shirts, uh, we won't, none of them will ship. You won't get charged. Don't worry. You won't get billed, but none of them will ship. So hopefully we can, uh, and that'll help us fund the remainder of the year. And uh, thank you everybody. All right. Yeah. yeah, I think it's also worth mentioning, too, a lot of people have the mindset of, you know, well, you know, I, I, I might do it later, but someone undoubtedly will buy it. You know, every single purchase helps make this happen. So definitely jump on. We uh, have an email. So there's a few there's a few recurring topics that we've talked about. Like, like on TechSnap, mm-hmm. one of them is like drive fragmentation. <laughs> right. On this show, it's the whole philosophy of to swap or not to swap. I've got an email about that that I want to touch on here in just a second. But first, we should probably thank our first sponsor of the Unplugged Show. And that, my friends is Ting. Ting is mobile that makes sense. My mobile service provider and Matt's mobile service provider, and they freaking rock. So Ting, what's great about them? No contracts, no early termination fees, and pay for what you use. Pay for what you use. Messages, megabytes, minutes, all that stuff. They all get added up at the end of the month. Whatever you just use, that's what you pay for. Flat dollars, six months per line, and then just whatever you need on top of that. That's great if you sometimes use the phone, sometimes you don't use the phone. And every Ting service includes hotspot and tethering, caller ID, voicemail, and their amazing Ting dashboard. But something that was pointed out to me in the Linux Action Show subreddit this week that we don't mention is Ting also doesn't have roaming charges. There's no additional charges for voice roaming within the U.S. As long as you have a CDMA signal, you should be fine. The Ting network has agreements in place with Verizon that allows you to roam over to the Verizon network and use that service, and you don't get dinged for it. It's one of the really nice little perks among the many other things with Ting. Now, of course, the average Ting bill is around $33 per month. Think about that. $33 $33 per month is the average Ting bill, and that's your smartphone with data, text messaging, all of that 
contract free with no early termination fees. Now, I just got my Nexus 5 on the Ting network. Ting has a bunch of really great devices at all ranges of prices. Right now, if you go to linux.ting.com, that's right, linux.ting.com, that'll take $25 off your first month of service if you already have a Sprint compatible device. If you don't have a Sprint compatible device, they'll give you $25 off your first device. When you buy this device, you own this device. They're not leasing it to you on like a, like a house on a mortgage where you pay into it every single month and after two years, you now own a completely out of date smartphone. No, no. Like a computer, when you buy it, you own it. And this is, as an active consumer, as people out there who are aware of the differences in that kind of setup, this is something I think we can all elect to be involved in, is let's change the dynamic of the mobile market because it's obvious the mobile devices, even if you don't think they're that hot, are going to play a huge role in the computing platform going forward. And the problem is the cards are stacked against us right now. Ting is changing all of that, and they're doing it in a very dynamic way. At starting with no contracts, starting with no early termination fees, and starting with the fact that you own your phone, and then they price it at a rate that is absolutely reasonable. And not only that, but if you're in a contract right now and you want to get out of that contract, Ting has an early termination relief program where they will pay up to $75 per line that you need to cancel. That's huge, people, because you can start saving right now if you switch to Ting, and you can get started by going to linux.ting.com. Man, I love Ting. Been oh, using yeah. them for a while. And as a longtime customer now, I got to tell you, that dashboard, that dashboard, Matt, it's like nothing anybody else has. And I know that as a Ting customer, when you signed up, when I when I handed that note to over you and said, Matt, have at it. Tell me what you think. That dashboard oh, was it, wasn't it? That was It was awesome. really this big point for me. And I still use it frequently because there are times to where like uh, if I'm not going to be using the phone for a while or maybe I just don't need any – I know it's, I'm not going to be getting any important calls. I'll literally just go ahead and toggle it off. I can keep the phone calls from coming in completely yeah, by this, using the dashboard. It's this so is cool. a great point. So as you know, yeah. back when I was in IT, uh, I, I, would have a, I would have a several different black <laughs> – this was back before Android and iOS had really <laughs> taken off. <laughs> I would have several different black devices and one Windows mobile device. And I never use the Windows mobile device. I right. was I was down with BlackBerry, man. I was a BlackBerry oh, yeah. guy. But I only needed one, right? But the company I worked for, they had to pay for all three lines all the time every single month. And then when like another tech needed to try something out for their client, there's no transferring. Like unless you want to call the Verizon rep and ask them after you explain to them what it is you're even trying to do. Ting does it all through their dashboard with a couple of clicks unless you get right back to work. It's so awesome. So go get started by linux.ting.com. And by the way, you need to order your device by December 13th if you just want to get FedEx Ground or December 19th for FedEx Express in order to guarantee delivery by December 23rd. So if you're giving somebody the gift of Ting for the holidays, get your order in before December 13th for the cheap shipping or December 19th for the uh, express shipping to get that guaranteed by uh, December 23rd. Yeah. So a huge thank you to Ting for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. Love those guys. Okay, Matt. So I want to cover this email that came in uh, from Bab. Because it's, it's a topic that we talk about a lot. No, it's all good. Oh, it's, it's good. No, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I, I felt where this is going. I was like, oh, I'm about to get I think we have one of those. Actually, I think we do have one of those at the end of the show. Well, oh, you no. gotta have one. Have to have at least one. Because <laughs> no. otherwise, what's the point, right? I tell yeah. you what. We got one that's going to get people really fired up uh, next. Cool. Yeah. Uh, okay. But this one comes in from Bob. It's safe territory. We're not going to get All anybody right. too upset. He says, hi, guys. Uh, just a quick note. Chris mused that maybe uh, the day is near that you could run with a machine without a swap partition. Well, this intrigued me, and for the last year, I've been running my 8 gigabyte laptop with no swap partition and have not noticed any issues, even when giving it a pretty thorough workout. In fact, it worked so well that I honestly forgot about it. One thing that had bugged me, though, was that the Hibernate hasn't been an option on Ubuntu for me. I just assumed that it was a config issue or the hardware not being supported. I found out I could run pm-hibernate command, but it would just simply not hibernate. My frustration boiled over today, and I went digging for clues. It looks like it may just simply be a case that a swap partition is required for hibernate to work as where the memory image is written out before the machine shuts down. I GOL'd, uh, that's groaned out loud, when I found this out. I'm not yet, uh, I cannot yet confirm this is my issue, but I thought I'd share experiences for the benefit of all. Bab. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Interesting. That is the yeah. downside to running without swap. And, you know, I have a swap. I, all, my, all my machines have swap right now. 
Do you do swap partitions still? I do. I mean, and, and honestly, it's just a legacy habit. I mean, it's like it, it's almost like building machines and putting a floppy to drive in it. You do something like out of habit, thinking, "Why the hell am I putting this thing in yeah, here?" Or this, actually, Matt, I don't mean to age you, but it's now CD-ROMs, Matt. It's not floppy drives anymore. What? It's, CD, it's CD-ROMs now. Yeah. Uh, well, so, I've got my cassette tape drive sitting right here. It works. You know, I can, <laughs> magnetic media is the future. God. <laughs> Wait, well, why hibernate when you can just either suspend or boot? Right. I mean, what kind of system takes that long to boot anymore? I, 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 I don't know. I put it out to the mumble room. If anybody in here has a strong feeling on swap partitions, I, I anybody in anybody in the uh, mumble room running swap free these days? Yes, kind of. I use swap. Yeah. Files okay. Instead. Um, can I? Uh, yeah, can I jump in quickly? Okay, you only need a ho- you only need swap if you want if you're using a laptop and you want to put it into Hibernate. If you've got more than two gigs of RAM, you do not need swap. Swap is only used for hibernation. Well, what about crashing? That's not true. Yeah, it's completely incorrect. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. <laughs> and it's on. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Okay. So um, let's right, see. You've got I even three have gigs s- of RAM. What is swap used for? I, I, I use a swap partition on... in order to compile my kernel. Usually I don't have in like five or six gigs partitioned or put on my rig, so I use like I know, knew this would be files. I knew this would be a hot topic. But <laughs> I, awesome. I have I have twelve okay, gigs of swap using... even on even on machines that have hundred and forty four gigs of RAM. Yeah, I do too. I yeah, even you because if you have no swap at all, the only negative thing I had is you can't hibernate. That's it. No, there's no negative thing. No, it's not. First of all, if you don't have any swap space, as soon as you're out of memory, the kernel either has to start killing random processes or panic. There's no other option. Yeah. Okay, but you've got you have even a little RAM, bit of swap. Four gigs of RAM, yeah. it's not an issue anymore. It's generally a good idea <laughs> to have. If I want to get to RAM, uh, five hundred gigs of swap, I think should be enough. Just as a safety, I mean, it's five hundred gigs. Right. You only yes. have a boot partition or the swap file. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, oftentimes, you'll make the swap only 512 megabytes or something, which yep. is just enough so that yeah. really inactive mm-hmm. stuff can get out of your way. Uh, because any, you know, free RAM is wasted RAM. So you use as much of your RAM as you can for your file system cache and things like that. So if a program is completely idle, why have it wasting memory that exactly. could be being used for cache mm-hmm. if you could swap it out? This is my philosophy yeah, too. Just to be safe. I'm and yes, always- having even just that little bit means that. Yeah, you but know, hard drives the, are a lot slower than RAM, out. so you want it all in RAM. Right, but if you the don't. program's always idle and its memory's not in use, then it's even exactly. worse than just wasting it. So you I've may as well just write it to the disk even if it's slow. It's not being used. Who cares if it's slow? We have, but the important have thing is that a lot of applications will adjust their behavior based on memory pressure. You know, for example, so I, Z, I the ZFS file, file system for... will free up some RAM when there's memory pressure. But for those couple yeah, of seconds, while I... that's happening... There's nowhere for the program to go. Whereas yeah, if, you, got my if you have swap, even iPhone, just a little iPhone. bit of swap. Most of the yeah, time, well, if you need a swap, you'll know that you need a swap partition. Otherwise, you right, never need it. Right, but your profile's being it. used. So it's good that you're yeah, storing it in RAM, right? Yeah, but I store it in RAM. Right, but that's good because it's actually fast then. But that doesn't change the argument about using swap. Why do we need a swap? Why do we need a swap if you've got more than 4 gigs of RAM? Because it's using more than four gigs of RAM. <laughs> I All regularly right. use more than I've four gigs of RAM just it. browsing. In you, never need you, you may not use more than four gigs of RAM, but there do compile. exist people who use more than four gigs of RAM. Yeah. All right, there you go. So you can see, I w- I did that as a pure demonstration that this is not a cut and dry <laughs> topic, right? That was that was Chris making a point right there. Is I think <laughs> there's no total right answer other than you should use some swap unless you're somebody who thinks you shouldn't. And that's really the way to leave it. And it's so funny because you can see how fired up people are, which moves us perfectly to our next email from Michael who says, yeah. oh, uh, it's time to move on. Now get ready for this. This is going to play right into Alan's cards, uh, Matt. Right. So, uh, cool. If any of those BSD guys are listening, maybe they could just skip ahead a couple of minutes. He says, hi, Chris and Matt. Longtime viewer of Linux Action Show and a short time viewer of Linux Unplugged since it's, well, new. Put uh, both your flame suits on, boys, because I'm about to uh, get some backlash from the listeners about this. I'm okay. done with Linux. I'm done with the Linux community, especially. I found Slackware in 2002 and I immediately fell in love. I was an everyday Windows user and thought of a virus-free system And that seemed amazing to me. I learned that right away, more learning was required. No problem. I'm a math geek, so I should be able to figure out all of this Linux stuff with no problem, right? Well, long story short, I've been on Linux for about 10 years. I loved it at first, but there were always little things that bothered me. I didn't think that there was anywhere else to go, though. I didn't want to get a Mac, and I certainly didn't want to go to Windows again. 
the community of Linux users was driving me crazy with their irrational views and immature ways of expressing those views. I have yet to meet a chill Linux guy. Now, hold on. I think you and I are pretty chill. No, I was going to say, that's like, I, I, I'm literally the most, <laughs> oh man. I mean, yeah. Cause I mean, it's like, I, not only do I run like every operating system there is in my office, but yeah, go ahead. Keep going. No. Point. Okay. All right. So he says, uh, <clears throat> funny enough, I found out about an alternative through Jupiter broadcasting. Oh yeah. Hearing Alan talk about BSD on TechSnap made me very curious, as I'm sure it has a lot of uh, as I'm sure it has a lot of other Linux guys. I tried it out and everything seemed basically the same. I didn't even have to learn much of anything except a different device name or something. Sure. He says I used the system to build and install ports. I explored and getting actively involved in the mailing list and forms, studying and passing on my own limited knowledge to those who could benefit from it. I pursued my new journey in other open source software world, learned the differences in BSD and GNU licensing. And fragmented and the fragmented nature of Linux distributions, realizing the FreeBSD community was more mature and well distributed, uh, and well distributed about industry education and research. Everything steered me towards working with and on BSD. Even though I expect some of the listeners to get upset about this email in typical Linux fashion. <sighs> well, so here's the thing: I've actually had fair dealings with both communities, mostly with Linux community, but with the BSD community as well. And I'm going to go out on a limb and actually agree with them. That truth be told, at the end of the day, when you look at hard numbers of my own personal experiences, I can't speak for other people out there. There is a vast maturity difference. <laughs> it's it's pretty it's pretty significant. Let me ask that you I that. I don't, but because I don't get I don't get as much uh, monkey poop slinging with uh, the is it guys. that or oh is yeah, it, it's it's ridiculous. Is it's it that it's a more narrow ner- narrow more no. narrow spectrum on the conversation? The BSD guys, they did the ones I dealt with. They don't give a flying crap if I'm on board or not. They're just there to answer questions to be polite about it. Do They're not fanboys. You don't think it's a factor of a smaller community that's yeah. more focused? Do you think it's the fact that the people there are there to get some work done? Yeah, I mean, that was, again, everybody's experience is going to vary. I'm going to get flamed no matter how I put this, but my, my personal experience is just that when I asked stupid BSD questions as a newbie, I didn't feel like I was going to be punished like you do with the Arch forms. Or oh, all. okay. That is interesting. Yeah, yeah. sometimes yeah. like... Or we, even the Ubuntu forms. When you mentioned yeah. I'm using your to install yeah. uh, VLC and then like 10 people pound on you, oh, you should be or, using... Or they don't... And the BSD guys didn't drop links in a post. That was my, that's my number one pet peeve. It's like, look, they're asking a dumb question that's fair, Answer the question, then mention, hey, by the way, use the search feature. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't be a douchebag and put a link That's in like there. That's like all aspects. I, uh, oh, my God. All right, Mumble Room. So, so yeah, let me I'm going to give points to the BSD guys. I'm just gonna what do you think, up. Mumble Room? Why is the BSD community generally considered more civil and calm than the Linux community? Anybody have any? Because because less more. fragmentation. The average less age fragmentation, is 10 years older. I would say. Mm-hmm. Less uh, fragmentation. Uh, uh, I would say. The average age of a FreeBSD developer is 10 years older than a Linux developer. Yep. Yeah, that's there too. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing or whatever, but uh, that it shows helps. that BSD, yeah, it does help. No, <laughs> I think that shows that uh, FreeBSD has a more technical, uh, technically oriented, uh, more server-oriented uh, user base other than Linux, which obviously is on the well, desktop. Uh, FreeBSD on the desktop. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, it might be a wash there, but I definitely think the the age thing probably plays a component. Maybe. I'm I'm 40 years old. The guys I'm dealing with are probably 40 and up. Um, you know. Popey, what do you think? So you're sitting, you're sitting from the perspective of Canonical, who's you know sees uh, a huge Linux user base. Uh, what do you think? Right, I don't speak for all of Canonical. <laughs> no, I know, but I'm curious because you have a unique perspective on this as somebody who's involved in a very large Linux project. Personal experience. So, so yeah, we have like you know a fairly significant community, and like any sure. community, we have people who are objectionable and uh, say things that are unsavory and okay. are unpleasant to people. Right. And the same as any other community, same as Windows and oh, yeah. know, OS OS yeah. ten fans and yeah iPad fans and whoever. I don't think it's necessarily unique to the Linux community that you get doofuses that make other people feel uncomfortable. I think that's just people being dicks, and they're dicks wherever they are. Do you, Wait, so what? I, yeah. Oh. yeah, see, that's the thing. Hold on see, here. I'd like to point out, too, that he felt the need to write a letter saying that we're all a bunch of dicks because he's switching to FreeBSD. <laughs> Isn't that the exact <laughs> Okay. He's doing it too. Again, there you go. It's all anecdotal at this point, anyway. That 
No, this is true. The claim is all anecdotal. It's not like and everybody's mileage is going to vary. This. Also, yeah. also then you look at the fragmentation. The arch forums. Oh, sorry, uh, just one thing. The arch forums are not representative of the entire Linux community. Neither are no. the Ubuntu no. forums. Neither but are I was the Ubuntu forums. I was using polar opposite ends of the spectrum. I was comparing the Ubuntu community to the arch forum community, and I, and they're definitely it runs hot and cold. Diff, depends on the time of day. Well, the, there is so another thing too. Time, you know, what, Usually, what it looks like outside, what the weather is, whether someone's pissed off, whatever. But you know. Yeah, I, so I, that's, so, uh, I've always assumed it's been a volume uh, just because there's right. more people in a community. There's more chances for jackasses. Right. But I was looking at like if I was like literally take a checkbox and go yes and no for everyone it was awesome and everyone it was no, I was running averages. And so for my averages, that was my experience. I think, I think the, the, but not, the problem not is full, you get I'm people – People who leave a community feel right. so angry that they have to, yeah. you know, in the same way that when someone unfollows a celebrity on, on, on Twitter, they'll, you know, announce to the world, that's it, I'm unfollowing you. Or they'll leave a post on a blog saying, you know, that's it, I'm switching to Arch. Or, you know, people feel the need to have their voice heard, declare. even if it's a negative one. And, and yeah, and declare when they're leaving and they're going yeah, away and throwing their toes out the pan. That's a good point. In a way, I think it's a that's way of natural point, progression. All right. All of us usually start upon Linux because it's the largest and most common to start on. Most of the time, it's usually a choice to change to a BSD base based on what we know and what we consider to be what rubs us right and what floats our boat. Yeah. That might be why the way of uniting together under the BSD umbrella will be a little bit more civil versus the Linux. Yeah, fanboys. there's just as much fanboyism over there because they always... Because, I mean, they just like FreeBSD, right? Or PCBSD. But right. then they, at the same time, they talk a bunch of crap and whatever about people who use Linux or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Anything. Oh, yeah, no, so I've seen the same exact thing. Yeah, they do that. I, I look at it. <laughs> Alan does it every day on TechSet or every <laughs> yeah. week. Well, sure. I look at it like this, is I think guys like Alan, who have a very set of practical expectations from the software they use. Okay, here's my here's my background. Uh, before I was even doing the Linux Action Show, I was I was using Linux, of course, but I definitely experimented with some FreeBSD file servers because at the time there was a bug that, that dramatically affected Linux's performance with uh, Adaptex SCSI cards, and FreeBSD did not suffer from this same bug. And I got massive better uh, multi multi user performance from a FreeBSD server than I did a Linux server. So I started right. deploying FreeBSD in in you know um, quite a bit actually. I, I think about seven or eight servers over. Over a span of a six month period, uh, that would have each of them having 300, 400, 500, 700 users hanging off of each server. And in my experience doing that, FreeBSD was excellent. It definitely got the job done. But sure. where for me, I started to have some problems, it started to fall down, was this was really early on in, in the Samba project developing their win bind technology where you could actually bind to an Active Directory, import the Active Directory NTIDs as UIDs, and actually set file permissions based on entries in the Active Directory. And this became an absolutely mission-critical function of our file servers because this was during the transition from NT4 to Active Directory. And the only place I could get that initially was on SUSE Enterprise Linux. And so we ended up going that route. And I found it interesting, though, that I was very happy with FreeBSD, but then as I needed something that was really kind of emerging, I ended up having to go back to Linux, and that's always kind of kept me there. Well, that's weird because Samba would be in the ports tree, so it would be just as updated on FreeBSD as it would anywhere else, unless you're talking about development that is only happening on Suzy because they're I don't, I don't remember what the details backing. were, actually, to be honest with you, because it was so early on that there were so many bugs, but I, 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 find, it, I find it to be more like... Because one Samba is actually developed on FreeBSD. Here's what I find it to be like. Is like there is, um, there are there is a definite range of crossover where both operating systems can do the same task, serve a web page, mm -hmm. you know, uh, handle a print job, whatever it is. And I there's can't other, think of anything that either of them can't do. Right. And well, there's other ranges. Eh, come on, let's be fair. There's other ranges where like you start to get more into the desktop spectrum, where there is some there is some rationale behind using Linux. And there's other areas where there's some rationale behind use BSD. And I think what happens is, as people make the transition, and whatever kind of like requirements they have, when when BSD fills those, they're kind of surprised all of a sudden. They're like, wait a minute, this this whole thing's been out there this whole time, and it has it's this one cohesive system that's done by this group, and it's all makes sense and is well documented. This it's rational. This is so awesome, and people are like, holy shit, this has been here the whole time, and there's like this massive realization about it and i think uh, as as a lot of people out there they come to this realization they're holy crap and they make this move just like our writer here is, has done uh michael and, but at the same time 
I've I've been that person who's made that switch, uh, like on my router and on my file server, and I've been like, it's awesome. But I haven't been able to make that switch in other areas that I use. You know, so it's uh, at the end of the day, I think I think Linux is 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 a little more diverse in the sense that you have a larger range of users from like you know people who just want to play Minecraft to people like Alan <laughs> right. who are building like these crazy amazing infrastructures yeah. on Scale Engine and. There's just this, there's this, like this, this crazy range of users, and that's, I sometimes leads to all this public drama, and there's all of this. this I think the GPL also adds to a little bit more of like this advocate mindset. Yeah. I think it I think does, the BSD yeah. license is a little more practical in some senses, and the GPL is a, is a little more um, advocate based, and uh, I think that yeah, also I, is a base of some of the yeah. attitude, maybe. Well, I think that now GPL is great. I, I think it's awesome, but there are headaches with it at times as well. It really just depends on what your goals are. Um, I, from an idealistic point of view, it's wonderful. You know, it's great. But it's not always the most practical thing in the world. Um, and I guess best examples of that is you don't really ever see a whole ton of uh, monetized open source desktop applications for home users. I know it's like a, a, a niche within the niche within a niche, but it's, you know, I'm kind of putting that out there to where with a closed source license, that's readily possible because, you know, no one's going to take your code and run with it mm -hmm. unless they pirate it. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think there's, you know, facets like that, but whereas like you have maybe a, you have the BSDs to where maybe the people would see that as more of a, it's just less, well, quite frankly, it's less verbiage in the, in the license itself, really. It's just, it's, it's almost, I hate to say, but it's almost easier to understand um, you pretty much know where you stand. Oh, yeah. So there's there's advantages there. Absolutely. Now, I'm not saying one's better than another. I'm just saying I think they, they serve different purposes, and so they probably appeal to different people. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, as far as BSD itself, I don't have a ton of experience using it. I just had good experiences with the community. Have you, really ever, have you ever you know? tried out PCBSD? I have. Uh, or I was actually an early tester uh, oh, okay. way back in the day. Um, I love the PBIs. I uh, still do. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've I, talked I, about that. Yeah. yeah. I really, really do. I still think that's – I think they nailed it. Um, you know, the port system's awesome on its own anyway. But, <laughs> but you know, that's just no-brainer. But no, I mean yeah. it, it has its advantages. It definitely ha – it interacts with your hardware differently as far as detection. It's less about bleeding edge, more about stability. Um, yeah, it definitely kind of feels like an old comfy chair that you know how it's going to work. You don't have to like cross your fingers. and You know, it has some certain advantages, but it doesn't mean that – PC, PCBSD was perfect. It definitely had some uh, some challenges along the way, but I think it's interesting to watch, and it's a hell of a great alternative. If Linux isn't your bag and you want to try something else, I really I would recommend checking it out. Certainly, yeah. You yeah, know, you know uh, if this is just we're just God, we're just scratching the surface. We're all over the place. If yeah. you want to get in deep on BSD, <laughs> go listen yeah. to BSD now. It comes out every mm -hmm. Friday on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. You heard from Alan. Yep. He's on there. He's, he's my co-host on TechSnap. He's the host of TechSnap, and also Chris Moore, the creator of PCBSD. Yeah. He co-hosts that with Alan, and they do it every week live on Wednesdays. It comes out for download on Fridays over JupiterBroadcasting.com. They just BSD now just had an interview with he's. This guy, he's not only one of the founders of the P of the FreeBSD project. Uh, he, I believe, he also was one of the co-creators. Uh, Alan's probably gonna yell at me. I believe he's one of the co-creators of Sysinstall, but also the inventor of ports, which is wow. amazing. Wow. Yeah, his Holy name is Jordan crap. Hubbard, and uh, they, did, they did an interview with him uh, on last week's. BSD now, if you guys want to go check that out. All right, uh, Alan, boy, see, now I'm in tech snap mode. Do what happens. <laughs> so hey, I've been upgraded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So look, I thought we'd, uh, last week when we were uh, gearing up for our Linux Mint review, one of the things, because people always kick around like Linux Mint is the perfect distro for new users, right? So I brought the wife in and I said, okay, honey, here's mm. Linux Mint, have at it. So I'm going to bring her in in just a second to get her opinion on Linux Mint and kind of share some of her thoughts on some of the things she ran into. But before we get to that, I want to say thank our second sponsor this week, and that is Digital Ocean. Digital Ocean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy to spin up cloud server. And it is crazy easy. Users can create a cloud server in 55 seconds and pricing plans start only $5 per month for 512 megs of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and one terabyte of transfer. DigitalOcean has data centers in New York, San Francisco, and Amsterdam. The interface is simple. It, they got a control panel that is amazing. Uh, power users can replicate at a large scale, and they even have a straightforward API. I've got an Archbox running over on DigitalOcean at $5 per month that distributes all of the content for our Unfilter supporters and also uh, some additional content for just fans of the Unfilter show. I have all of that running through a $5 a month DigitalOcean instance. And I'm looking at this Archbox, I'm like, damn, son, I got more resources available to me. And I'll right. tell you, that SSD... It really, actually, even on a system that's up in the cloud, makes a big difference. Not only do, do, do updates just 
rock on that thing. But anytime I'm interacting with it, uh, IO contention is never a problem for me. And I, I, maybe I sound a bit like a jerk here, but I hate waiting on my disc. Out of all, right. I, I do not, I do not spend time getting memory and CPU to only wait on the damn disc. And SSDs solve that problem. When you combine that with DigitalOcean's incredible connection, it has been rocking. I downloaded the Unfilter Supporter Show using BitTorrent Sync at two megabytes a second from my unfil, uh, from my DigitalOcean VPS. And I got to tell you. That's just the peak of what it is. I've seen 10 megabytes a second. I've seen more coming out of that thing. It's awesome. And by the way, DigitalOcean is offering a fantastic deal for listeners of Linux Unplugged. If you'd like to try out DigitalOcean for two months, because they're going to give you a $10 credit, and if you get the $5 server like I've got, that's going to get you two months, when you use our special promo code, Linux Unplugged December. Linux Unplugged December will get you a $10 credit on a DigitalOcean account that you can go try out. DigitalOcean has these droplets. It's all based on KVM virtualization. They deploy to these SSD drives with their amazing hardware that all, all backed up by RAID storage, uh, ECC RAM, and these droplets let you spin up a server in no time. You can, you can pre-pick from Fedora, CentOS, um, Ubuntu, uh, several others. You can have them pre-configured with the LAMP stack. You can have them pre-configured with Docker. You're ready to go. They got an, they got a flexible API, and they even have, if you can believe this, hourly pricing. So if you just need to test something for a little bit on the public web, you can throw it up on a DigitalOcean VPS, take advantage of their hourly pricing, bang on it for a while because it's up on the web, it's public, it's got one terabyte of transfer, it's got these SSD storage so you can have hundreds of people bang on it to actually get real world testing and only pay what you use for like, you know, what, half hour? That's nothing. In fact, I was just talking with Michael Dominic from our Coda Radio program. He had a project over the last week where he spun up 10 DigitalOcean servers for a little while. He ended up spending like 17 cents. It's crazy. Love it. Their web ad administration panel is awesome, but DigitalOcean also offers a vast collection of tutorials in their community section on their website. Users can submit articles to that section, and if DigitalOcean publishes it, you'll get paid $50 per published piece. So we'll have a link for that in the show notes. Go check out DigitalOcean. We have a brand new promo code. It's going to get you a $10 credit on DigitalOcean service. That's Linux Unplugged December. Brand new code. Go over there, try it out. You guys, are so many things. I Here's... Here's like a little taste of, I've been thinking about setting up an XMPP server on DigitalOcean, right. oh, a nice. Zimbra server on DigitalOcean. I've already got BitTorrent Sync and a web server on DigitalOcean. I'm even thinking about taking, a, I don't know, maybe a Saigo in the chat room could help me on the pronunciation, Quasal, the uh, KDE, the awesome KDE IRC client, and putting the Quasal client on my DigitalOcean VPS. That way I'm just always logged into the Jupyter Broadcasting IRC chat, and I can collect from my, I can connect from my front end on my KDE desktop. It's just so many things you can do. And at $5 per month to have an awesome Linux-powered VPS in the cloud that you get root access to, oh, man, go check out DigitalOcean and use the promo code Linux Unplugged December to take advantage of that two-month offer. It's so great. A lot of people out there have been trying this out, and their support is fantastic. So go try it out, DigitalOcean.com, Linux Unplugged December. And thanks to Digital Unplugged for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. Would I say DigitalOcean Unplugged? It kind of fits. That's a, hey, that works for me. These guys were awesome. You know? So, Matt, let's uh, bring the wife in here. Uh, Andrew, are you All with right. us? Are you here there, Andrews? All right. So, uh, over the last week, I uh, had you try out a Mint here and there, Spotty, and uh, I wanted to bring you into the show to get a completely new Linux user perspective on Mint. Did you think, was Linux Mint the distro, like, if you were going to switch, could I put a Linux Mint computer in front of you and have you actually be successful? Well, only if you actually like set it up for everything that I would use it for first. Yeah. Because uh, I tried their app store and it just really didn't do it for me. Yeah. So what was the problem there? Because I mentioned a little bit on last, but I don't know if I gave it its due. Well, basically, I mean, it's, it's great that it's broken down into like five or six main categories, I think, or maybe there were like 10. Anyway, it was it was good the way they had internet, photo, whatever, but... After looking at like the photo things, that's where I went first since I'm so photo centered. Yeah. Um, I was really discouraged. It looked like I would need to have like minimum five programs just to import a picture <laughs> or, or try out a lot of different programs just to see, you know, what would be the best to import pictures. Yeah, that was you, you kind of felt like there was like you could string several programs together to get what you wanted, but you wanted, you wanted like plug the camera in one program comes up and takes care of all of the things you needed. Yeah. And it's not that that wasn't there, but you just didn't find it in the app store. 
Well, I definitely didn't. Like the descriptions are very um, technical and I'm, I think I'm a little better than the average user, but I, I'm still an average user. <laughs> so um, having that it says, uh, I know what a GUI is, and that's great. Uh, that's kind of what I would expect as, as a, a typical user. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they all kind of advertise the GUI aspect. Now, there was a little bit of a, of a bumpy road. So when I have, when I'm testing out a distro and I want to try it on full hardware acceleration, I don't want to use virtualization. I have this external USB 3 uh, hybrid drive. It's like SSD. It's like a 32 gigabyte SSD and uh, a one terabyte hard drive spinning drive. And that's what I load the um, the distros on. And then the Bonobo lets you choose what device you want to boot from. So I just choose the external USB device and I boot from that. And so here I am. I'm like, here you go, wife. I'm going to give you this Bonobo. And you just sit down here and you use you use Linux Mint. And Ange is like, oh, cool. I'm going to get to use your System76. And then what happened, Ange? Okay, so this is great. So he, he's like, all right, here you go. And he turns it around. And I'm sitting pretty much where Chase does when they do a uh, unfilter. So they face each other. Or, and Yeah. And I go to click on something and uh, nothing happens. So I try the corners. And I'm not watching because the screen isn't facing me at this point. So I'm just like, I'm figuring like she's making mistakes. Yeah. And, and I click, I like double click the computer icon and the whole screen like freaks out <laughs> and I don't know what's going on. And, and I was asking him like, you know, how do I do anything? Cause I didn't have a, a, Oh gosh, all I can think of is calling it a start bar. What, what is it called when it's on Linux? <laughs> well, you, you can call it the, you can call it the start yeah. menu. Everybody knows what you're okay. talking about. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, that menu wasn't even there. And so when I asked, what do I do? And what do I even do? He, he was, he scoffed. <laughs> I was like, well, okay. So then I turned it towards him and he was like, what did you do? <laughs> and, and he's like, oh, he had unplugged the hard drive before he turned around the laptop. <laughs> so her first experience with Linux Mint 16 was total crash fest because me being the dumbass, I'm turning around the laptop. I'm like, well, we don't need to have all these things connected as I'm moving the machine. So right, I unplugged right. the USB devices. And then, of course, the USB device was the actual operating systems hard drive. Right, row. <laughs> yeah. So then he got it up and running and, and I was like, oh, good. It's a start bar. That, that's a good. <laughs> that's a good start. <laughs> and, um, and he said, well, you know, do something. So I went to digitalblasphemy.com. Um, uh, from the suggestions in, um, on Twitter, I got a new background, which surprisingly felt just normal. Like I did that without any problems. Just right click the right resolution, set as background, just like Windows, just like Mac. Super easy. Um, and then uh, let's see, what was the other thing I tried? Oh, I did the sticky note. That was good. Oh, yeah. You liked that. In fact, you wanted me to add that to your Mac. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, because I never like, okay, well, I on my Mac, I have a really old version of OS of uh, Office for Mac and, and it's slower than molasses and I don't like text edit because of the lack of formatting. So I need something where I can just throw stuff um, temporarily so that I can keep it there and yeah. then get it later. Yeah. Well, hmm. so, uh, so your, your overall, I guess your to encapsulated, it was, yeah, I could use it, but you didn't feel like, now, did you feel like, do you feel like that would be the case if I gave you Windows today? I'd have to completely set it up for you. Is that any different than if you were switching to Windows? No, no. Or I mean, uh, the answer is I think I could be just fine on Windows, surprisingly. Do you think you could be just fine on Mint? No, because I don't, I don't know if you recall, but you're like, go find a program. So I went to uh, <laughs> Firefox <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I typed photo programs for Mint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, and, win Windows 7 versus Windows 8, I mean, which one would you feel more comfortable with? Oh, I don't even want to look at Windows 8. <laughs> Good answer. I really don't. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. I, I, was, I was a big fan of uh, Windows 2000. I didn't even like mm -hmm, XP. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I no, I, I don't even want to try 8. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for trying that. You were a good yeah. guinea pig. And awesome. uh, I think in the future, I might have you try elementary OS and see what you think about it. And maybe we'll have you come back on Linux Unplugged and yeah. share your thoughts. Yeah. Oh, that would make uh, Ryan 516 happy. Yeah. Well, you're a Mac user and uh, elementary OS is the closest like sort of Mac OS experience, mm -hmm. I think, on Linux right now without being like uh, just a ripoff theme. They, they yeah. really try. I think Pear OS might be fun because I just just to yeah. see how pa different Pear it is. Pear OS, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be my choice. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, thanks, Ange. Yep, no problem. All righty, thank you. So, uh, Matt, we got one more little bit of uh, email I wanted to get to uh, before sure. we go. Actually, it wasn't even an email. I, I keep calling that because we've gotten so much email recently. But this was actually a subreddit post, and I'll read it, and then we'll jump into the uh, Mumble uh, group and uh, see what the guys think. But uh, he says, uh, right. "Hello." 
I got a show idea for you. Tiling Window Manager Roundup. Ah. (laughs) I feel the Linux Action Show has not showcased many tiling window managers. They can be really customizable and in turn... Boost your productivity when it comes to certain tasks. I personally run an i3WM setup, and although I sometimes use KDE No Man Cinnamon, I always keep coming back to good old i3. My main suggestion is go over to uh, reddit.com slash r slash Unix porn. They regularly will show off how beautiful a tiling window manager can be, both new and old. So he wanted us to take the tiling window manager challenge. And I got to say, Matt, I just... Are you, so, are you as excited as I am? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think yeah, so. Like yeah. for me, it's, I've I actually, think it's worth doing. I think, in fairness, despite uh, what we may, despite what we might feel, uh, that we need, we need, you know, because remember the arch thing. Oh, that stupid arch crap! <laughs> you know, that was me. I was Mister Oh Arch is stupid. I, was too. I won't ever I was, use arch. I was and too. now I'm using. Now I'm basically using arch. Yeah. So based on that, <laughs> even though even though I've tried it and I was never impressed with it, I have to eat my own dog food and actually at least try it. But, then I can dog on it. But you know, Matt, KDE is so nice. <laughs> I'm liking KDE these days. All yeah, right, yeah, so yeah. I gotta let's let's jump into the mumble room. Is uh, oh, okay. let's ask the mumble room uh, guys, what do you think? Do do uh, Matt and Chris have to take the window t- the tiling window manager challenge? I think well, if, yeah, if you, it would definitely be interesting. So if you do it, if you do it, you got to do all of them, and there's about eleven. I don't want to oh, do all of them. I like want to <laughs> narrow it down to one <laughs> or two. Two, yeah. So we've I'm talked sure about there's more than eleven. We've talked yeah, about we've talked about album. awesome and window could, and yeah. and uh, we see we've done awesome and uh, X Nomad on the show before, <laughs> and I both times I felt like I felt like I was just doing a fan service because to me mm-hmm. I feel like I'm compromising a modern desktop experience. Like I I come from the '80s, people, where we didn't have desktops, and God damn it, we finally have desktops, and I want the best <laughs> possible desktop possible. <laughs> and why hey, the hey. hell would I go back to a tiling window manager? Windows 1.0 was a tiling window manager. Yeah, exactly. That puts it in perspective. Well, 3.1 sort of was, too. Uh, I, yeah, I think see, if, the thing about tiling window manager... I think if you're going to do it, you don't need to do all, like, 25,000 of them. Uh-huh. You only really need to do a dynamic... The big three. Um, like a dynamic tiling window manager, all right. which would be i3. i3, yeah. And then you need to do, because most of the others are all forks of DWM, like even Awesome is just a fork of DWM. So I would, uh, I'd probably do i3, okay. Awesome, and Xmonad, because those three right. seem to be yeah. the three main ones. Well, the one I hear the most about. Spend, you need to do that. You have to spend at least a month or two with uh, each one to really learn them. Oh, f- no. yeah, right. <laughs> That's not oh. going to happen. <laughs> no, uh, you, just, you need to uh, just use yeah. the right poison. I use my, ride my fling with X and, and, and then I'll I3. go surf YouTube with links. And uh, you know, I mean, it's just kind of like, wait, what? to me, tiling window managers are just not TTY4, TTY4. Tiling window managers are for pretentious idiots who just want to feel cool about using a computer. Ouch. Yeah, it's just, that's that's not, not at all. Oh, that's, that is exactly I, 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 I completely that. agree. <laughs> okay, all right. So okay. <laughs> there we go. I no, think, okay, the, the links and YouTube thing may have been a little much. I think we got to try out i3. <laughs> I think we got to try out i3. That would be fair because that's not, we can settle on one and really put it through its paces. This sure. is the one that we always – everybody keeps coming back to i3. This is the one we hear the most about these days. And we've done Xmonad. We've done Awesome Window Manager on the last show. Maybe it's time to try out i3. Now, I'm not saying immediately because we got a lot of stuff lined up on the big show. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe the end of I, the I'd year. I'd say that maybe once it, we get through our big stuff, yeah. I think you know, once we're looking for topics, I think it's a great. I think it's a, it's a fair thing. I mean, you know, we we tried arch; it worked out. And who knows? Maybe we'll have a a passing uh, affinity. Maybe possibly. you know what, I, Matt? I you're right. You, you're right. <laughs> I, I said the same thing about arch, and now here I am running yeah. arch everywhere. It just allows us to at least we can for myself. I can speak intelligently and be like, you know what? I I really love it because of blank, or I really hate it because of blank. I can actually point to something directly versus just you know, like, no, 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 I don't want to try it. You know that kind of thing. You know, although I'm going to tell you one of the reasons I like Arch is because I get the most current KDE anywhere. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, and that's a benefit we weren't even aware we really fully yeah. rationalizing that we missed. We heard it, but we never really materialized in front of us. I guess you know. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set up an i3 desktop that is there powered on the back end by KW. Right. Oh, there, there. there you go. Oh, I have, see where you're going with this. I see. I doing. will have wobbly windows, although I will never get <laughs> wobbly windows. <laughs> but I know it's there. I know it's there. Man. Oh, if God. I ever needed it, I know it's there. Um, oh. Look, before we run this week, it is getting close to the holiday season, and I I've gotten a lot of crap from our from our very own mumble room about talking about Steam and humble too much. <laughs> but I don't know if you're like me every now and then around the holiday season, I get the gaming itch. Even if I don't have the time, it's like baked into my brain. It's time to game. 
And there's a new Humble Bundle, which we, we, will, we will probably talk about on last, but it'll be several days into it. Now it's just launched. There is a new Humble Bundle out, and there's a couple of games on there that make the entire thing worth it. Serious Sam 3, BFE, and Natural Selection 2, which Natural Selection 2 is that game where you get to play as the human or the alien. That's well, that's the one I like. Yeah. 13 days left on this Humble Bundle. All I'm saying is I want all of you to go over there and dominate this thing for Linux again. Let's just go over there and remind them why they, why they go through all the effort on porting some of this S to Linux. Because if you look at this lineup, uh, one, two, three of the games are not available for Linux. This is not a trend we can allow, my friends. No, and the no. trend must be our friend. So therefore, we must go over to Humble Bundle and use our Linux dollars or Linux Bitcoins, as it were, to own this chart so we can show them that it's still worth their effort to port to Linux. And the entire damn thing is worth it for Natural Selection 2. Sanctum 2 is also in there. Magicka, plus all the DLC for Magicka is in there. Orcs Must Die 2 is a community favorite, but it is not available to Linux. And those bastards must fix that. So go over there and buy that sucker so that way the next time a developer gets in there without a Linux version, Humble Bundle kicks them in the nuts. So the nice. only way it's going to happen is if we vote with our wallet. And uh, I don't know. I get a little fired up. Let's see how are we doing right now. Um, let's see. Okay, okay, Matt, you ready? Average purchase ready. price three dollars eighty nine cents. Okay, okay. Yeah. Average Windows price three dollars ninety two cents. Average Mac price four dollars twenty nine cents. Uh, Average Linux price. You ready for it? Do, do, I'm do, ready. Do, 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 four dollars eighty five cents. Hello, everybody. That's right. That's right. I don't know. I'm just thinking. How it is? Those are some good games. Too bad I own all of them already. <laughs> right? It's like, oh my. Yeah, that's the only thing is Humble Bundles, it's getting a little harder for them to have the exclusive, but that's understandable. That's, that's okay. That's totally cool. All right, Matt. Well, we have a really big Linux action show coming up on Sunday. Man, I got more stuff we could dig through, but I wanted to just, before we run, I wanted to give people a little heads up. The holidays a cometh. So uh, Matt and I are going to do a little double recording on Tuesday the 17th. So not next week, but the following week. We're going to do two Linux unplugs back to back starting at 12 p.m. Pacific. And that will uh, that'll be uh, we'll probably go for about 12 p.m. Pacific till about 3.30 p.m. Pacific. And that'll be our live show for the 24th, too. So we won't have a live show. That'll be a released. That second episode will be released on the 24th. That way we can take uh, the holiday week off. So uh, if you'd like to join us for a special long edition we're going to need your help out there, too. We're going to need you in the mumble room. We're going to need your emails. So if you've been waiting to email Linux Unplugged, now's the time. Go over to Jupiter Broadcasting, click that contact link, and choose Linux Unplugged from the dropdown. Because we need your emails. We need your feedback. You fuel the show. And on Tuesday, the 17th, without you, we will have no show. So we need your feedback, and we need you in the mumble room. Join us live. Normally, we're live on a 2 p.m. on Pacific, but on that Tuesday, the 17th, we'll be starting at 12 p.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv. Don't forget, you can uh, always get hold of us in the subreddit over at linuxactionshow.reddit.com. We check that out for stories we should follow for the show, your feedback, threads, and all that kind of stuff. Hey, Matt, have a great week. I'll see you on Sunday for some hardware reviews, all right? All right. See you then. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. We'll see you right back here next week.